Hi, I'm Shep Hyken, and here's what's coming up on this episode of Be Amazing or Go Home. Take a bite of the apple. How can you be more like the biggest and best rock star companies? I'll tell you three ways that can strengthen your brand. Leading with accountability. Sam Silverstein drops by to share how you can create an accountable workforce, develop committed employees, and retain amazing people. The relentless pursuit of excellence. Manly Feinberg tells us about his lessons for leading with impact and how you can accomplish what's really important. And finding your why. An amazing quote from Simon Sinek explains the reason why a customer would choose to do business with you. So are you ready to be amazing? Stay tuned for all of this and more coming up next on Be Amazing or Go Home. Hello, I'm Chef Hyken, and this is Be Amazing or Go Home, the show that's dedicated to take you from average to amazing. Now, there are plenty of rock star companies out there, big and small, that are amazing when it comes to customer service. And what can you learn from these companies, and how can you take their ideas and make them yours? Well, Apple was rated the best global brand for the sixth year in a row by Interbrand. Google was second, and Amazon was third. Think about how big these brands are and how they've woven their way into our culture. So, how do these brands make the list? Well, they're evaluated in 10 areas called brand strengths. Apple was a standout in three areas, engagement, differentiation, and consistency. These three areas are what drive the experience at Apple. That is why their customers are in love with the company. And there's no reason why any company can't do the same. And once we learn how they do it, the key is to make it work for our companies. It's not about just learning, but also about executing what we learn. So with that in mind, let's break down these three areas of brand strength and how they can apply to your organization. Number one is engagement. This starts with having active conversations with your customers in person and online via your website, social media, or any other way the customer and you engage with each other. How do you connect with your customers? How fast do you respond to the request and their comments? Do you promote online conversations that intrigue and engage your customers? Engagement is the first step toward making an emotional connection, one that starts to build a bond between you and your customer. Number two, differentiation. Why should someone do business with you instead of your competition? Figure that out and you have a value proposition that helps separate you from others. The key is that it's really different. That can't be like because we have great customer service. While that may be true, that's an answer that your competitors might also share. Find out what makes you truly different, something that your customer cares about, and then exploit it. And number three, it's consistency. Every time a customer has an interaction with the company, regardless of it being in person, on the phone, or online, they have a similar experience. It's simple, customers love to know what to expect. A consistent and predictable experience creates confidence which leads to trust, which can also lead to loyalty. Now, Apple's standout strengths can apply to any size company, large or small. Pay attention to how Apple treats its customers, emulate some of their best practices, and metaphorically speaking, take a bite out of the apple. Accountability is the highest form of leadership. That's a quote from the most trusted voice on accountability, and that's Sam Silverstein. Everything rises and falls on leadership, and when leaders own and model their own accountability, they create a place where everyone wants to work. And here to talk about how you can cultivate accountability in the workplace and propel people to their highest potential is the most trusted voice on accountability himself, my buddy Sam Silverstein. Welcome hey, to Chef. Be Amazing or great. Go Home. Thanks. It's great to be here. So I'm excited to talk about accountability. I'm excited to talk about your new book, No Matter What. We'll talk about that in a moment, but let's talk first about your definition of accountability. It's real simple. Accountability is keeping your commitments to people. We're responsible for things, but we're accountable to people. Okay, accountable to people, responsible for things. Give me an example. Well, it's all about the commitment, but 
the example would be you're responsible for that report. You're responsible to get your work done, but I'm accountable to you. So accountability always involves a relationship. Mm -hmm. I'm not accountable for the report. I'm responsible for the report. So everybody claims they, oh, these are my job responsibilities. That's a piece of the big puzzle. Right. Okay. And they've got to do what they're supposed to do. But really what they need to understand is what is the result? What is the impact of those responsibilities? Who does it impact? Uh, what happens if you don't do it? What happens if you don't do a great job? What happens if you do do a great job? Right. All right. So here's the thing. When you talk about responsibilities and commitments and, and the difference between responsibility and accountability, the traditional view is I'm going to hold you accountable. And that I'm going to hold you accountable is like... You're using the fingers like it's a gun. Yeah. yeah. And, you know... It, <laughs> this is... <laughs> exactly. Mm -hmm. it, that doesn't build a relationship. That, that tears apart a relationship. So accountability starts with the leader. Everything rises and falls on leadership. It starts with the leader being accountable to the people first and through a series of actions creating an environment or an organizational culture, a corporate culture, that actually inspires people to want to be accountable to each other. To each other, to the leader, to the organization. Got it, all right. You use the word commitment. Yeah. All right, let's talk about that because in your new book, No Matter What, it says the 10 commitments of accountability. So, first of all, we define a commitment as no matter what. Mm -hmm. That's why the book's titled that. It's not a maybe, it's not I'd like to, it's not, well, I couldn't do it because the economy was down. It's strictly, I'm going to do this no matter what. Mm -hmm. And these are commitments that start from the leader first. And although they're not all spoken or they're, they're, most of them aren't even communicated as I promise you I'll do this, but they're commitments the leader takes on. When the leader does that, everything changes. All right. So give me an example of a commitment. One of the commitments is a commitment to the truth. Okay. That seems like a pretty important commitment. Uh, I would say so. <laughs> and it's not just the truth in terms of facts, but it's, in, it's the truth in sense of life, meaning that part of the truth is we're all created equal, so I'm going to treat everyone the same. That's truth. And when a leader recognizes that truth and acts accordingly, things change in the workplace. Got it, got it. So uh, that's one of them. Give me another one. One would be a commitment to the organizational values. All right, so that's a big one, organizational values, and I know you do a lot of work in this area. Right. So a quick uh, idea of what that's about, and then I want to talk about organizational values because that's really what this is all about. Okay, so one of our clients uh, in Texas, for instance, we help them establish a set of values and not just create it on paper, but actually implant them into the hearts of the people that work for that organization. How do you do that? Well, it's, <laughs> that's big. We don't do it in two hours, but there's four distinct types of values that need to be created for an organization. We've identified those based on all of our research. We have an organizational assessment. We know where they're strong. We know where they're weak. And we look at that cultural assessment and then help them create values based on what they believe. Not what I believe, not what you believe, but what they believe. All right, so you get buy-in from the people. Right, right. Th they're part of that process. Right. So that people won't argue with their own data or their own ideas. Exactly. That's part of it. So we have this set of values. Now the key is we need to live them. And mm -hmm. so it starts from the top with leadership committing to the values, which means if one of their values is we respect everyone, well, that, that sounds pretty powerful and pretty important. Mm -hmm. Well, what happens when the head of IT disrespects a couple of people in the business? And you've talked to that person and they continue to do it. Are you willing to let go the head of IT? Are you willing to let go your number one salesperson because they're not living the values? There's certain moments... And by the way, what should the answer be? The, if you aren't going to protect the values by allowing that person to go someplace where that behavior is acceptable, and you know what I mean by that, mm -hmm. then you might as well eliminate the values because they're a lie. Right. So yeah, you gotta let that person, let go. person go. But that doesn't happen. Most of the time, we see organizations, they back down. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can't let my number one salesperson go. I can't let my right. head of IT go. Well, when you do that, you've just told everyone in the organization the values don't really matter. You're if asking you have... everybody to commit to the values, but the leadership's not willing to commit to exactly. holding people accountable to those values. Not hold them accountable. Oh, Make sure that, that they're... That's right. <laughs> no. That... You're responsible yeah. to be living those values. Right. I'm going to live them as a leader, which, not, which means it's not just that I'm living the values through my actions personally, but I'm protecting the culture of the organization. If you're not living the values, I'm not going to let you stay here. I'm protecting the culture for everyone in the organization. Right. Tony Shea from Zappos hires for 10 core values, and he's very quick to say, I'll fire 
for anybody deficient in even one of those values. Absolutely. All right, so we're down to the last few moments here. I always ask the one thing question. One thing you want to leave us, tell us about, remind us about, what would it be? Simply this. Everything we've been taught about accountability is wrong. Accountability is not a way of doing. Accountability is a way of thinking. And specifically, it's how leaders think about their people. And when leadership takes on the responsibility to be accountable first and to create an environment, a culture that inspires their people to be accountable, that's when they're going to get the results they're looking for. All right, that's Sam Silverstein, author of No Matter What, The Ten Commitments of Accountability. Thanks for being on the show, man. My pleasure. Time now for the amazing app, brought to you by First Rule, and this app is an industry disruptor. Tunity developed the first app of its kind that allows users to hear live audio from muted televisions. Through a patented deep learning and computer vision technology, Tunity identifies a live video stream and its exact timing syncing the audio with the user's mobile device. You can scan the TV and Tunity syncs to that channel's audio, then streams the TV's audio directly to your device and hear what's happening in real time. And through headphones or a speaker, you can listen to any muted TV anywhere, including bars, restaurants, gyms, doctor's offices, airports, and more. Research also shows that offering Tunity at venues improves customer retention by up to 30%. Tunity is on a mission to revolutionize the out-of-home TV experience and transform the way brands engage with customers. Tunity is truly an amazing app. How can you lead with impact? Well, that's a question that author and award-winning keynote speaker Manly Feinberg has dedicated his life to answering. Manley's keynote speeches vividly share compelling lessons from his adventure and leadership experiences in a way that allows you to relate to your mountains and reach your next summit. You'll find out exactly what that means as Manley joins us in the studio to talk all about it. Manley, welcome to Be Amazing or Go Home. Grateful to be with you, my friend. So we're talking about mountains and your book, Reaching Your Next Summit, nine vertical lessons for leading with impact. So let's talk about what reaching your summit is, a little background and what some of these lessons about how you can uh, lead with impact. Uh, but yeah, thank you. It's, it's based on uh, 25 years of experience climbing mountains and then coming back to the real world day-to-day -day life. And by the way, and, you are uh, a real mountain climber. I mean, you get up there and on like truly, I mean, just look, is this you? Yes. Is this you? Yeah, that, that is me. That's yeah. you right there? Yeah, yeah. Scary, scary. Uh, but you're, you're doing it, but you've got ropes to hold on. Yeah, yeah. Just, ropes, you're not yeah. like that other guy. No, no. Yeah. Sleep on that. Sleep. Great respect for him. But yeah, I always mm -hmm. use a rope in case I fall. So. I think that's a good idea. I expect to fall, actually. So, wow. Yeah. So if you're you pushing expect yourself, to you're, fall. Yeah. Yeah. If, if you're pushing yourself, you're going to fall. That's a life lesson right there. Mm -hmm. Can we talk about that for sure. a moment? Yeah. yeah. Is that one of the lessons? It, not directly, but it is embedded in some of the lessons. And that is, if we expect to fall and we're pushing ourselves enough that we fall, then we need to build systems to support ourselves so that we can do that comfortably. So we can embrace the risk and lean into it. Mm -hmm. Embrace exposure of stepping up in the work environment, as an example, or raising your hand in the meeting, which a lot of people... You might have the idea pop in your head, but then you got to raise your hand, you got to share it, and have the courage to right. do that. And you want to encourage people you work with to try things that we know won't work. Yeah. Go all the way to the line. Find out. You, you may not even know where the line is. I mean, we encourage people in the customer service world to go as far as they can to taking care of the customer. And if they cross the line, we'll teach them what they did. That's the fail. Mm -hmm. Bring them back. And by the way, we use that as a lesson to teach everybody, you know, so they Absolutely. know where they can go. And it's the same kind of thing. You push. You, you want people to push themselves to a point where, hey, once in a while it doesn't work, but we're better off because right. of it. So to do that, for people, it, it sounds great. So everybody would agree, yeah, if I embrace exposure and if I step up and engage more in my workplace and have mm -hmm. my team do the same, everybody's in, right? It's a simple thing. Yep. The question is, how do we do it? So that's where the lessons, vertical lessons come in. Basically, I reverse engineered these expeditions and climbing experiences and applied them in the business world. So a great example is the belay itself, which is B-E-L-A-Y. It's and that's this, where you're holding yeah. on to the ropes, helping it's, somebody else from, from dying. Exactly. It's the, yeah, so literally, yeah, it's such a simple mechanism, right. but the person literally has your life in their hands. Mm -hmm. So for you to push yourself climbing, or in the business world as an example, you need to know that somebody's got their, your life in their hands. They have you on belay. So how do we do this intentionally and consistently? And that is build deeper, more powerful relationships. So we do feel comfortable raising our hand in the meeting or stepping up to take on a new responsibility. We have to proactively uh, build those relationships consistently. And put people on belay. Yeah, exactly. So All right. every day. So that's one. Day. Give me another one. 
Another one uh, is declaring your current climb. This is a, a critically powerful lesson and that what I learned in the mountaineering world, one of the reasons I know climbing is easier than business and personal life that we deal with, is that you can only climb one mountain at a time in the mountaineering world. But everybody I ever talked to always says, I say, you, are you trying to climb one mountain in your life or do you feel like you're trying to climb multiple? Everyone says multiple. Exactly. I mean, those are the obstacles in our so, way to getting things done. The time, right. uh, you know, people that I'm having struggles with. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's lots of mountains, if you will. So declare your current climb is a, a declaration of momentum on one initiative. To say this initiative above all else is the one I'm going to move forward every single day. That doesn't mean you're not going to get to the other items, but the idea is that you're going to say this intentionally, consistently is the one item I'm going to move forward every day. Wow, great. And then you can get to all the other mm -hmm. crazy stuff. That's, you know, all right, I, I love the, the magic of three. Give me mm -hmm. a third one. Okay, third one is a great one. Let's say you declare your current climb. You've been building your blaze every day, building mm -hmm. the relationships you need. Perfect example this time of the year, any time of the year for that matter, you've fallen off the horse and you've lost momentum. Momentum uh -oh. is key. So the master of the art of the restart lesson is all about momentum. And the idea here is simple, is when you realize I've so fallen. So this is restarting is the lesson. Exactly. Okay. Restarting. Master of the art of the restart. Master of the art of the restart. Yeah. Okay. The idea is that when we fall on the mountain, we, we, we hang for a minute, we recover, and then we get back on the mountain and start moving again as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. We don't wait till Monday. We don't wait till the first of the year. We don't wait for the first of the week. We start immediately. Pick yourself up and go. Exactly. So mm -hmm. 24 hours later, it's the next time the sun comes up, you know, we have the calendar restart. That's like, well, I'll do it Monday or I'll do it first quarter or the, the emotional restart, I call it. Well, when I feel like it, I'll do that. I mm -hmm. feel better, no. When the sun comes up the next day, immediately restart. It's a completely different mindset. And that builds an incredible amount of momentum when we do it consistently. All right, declare your mountain, which means focus right in front of you, build your relationships, mm -hmm. and when you get knocked down, you gotta get back up and restart. Yeah, absolutely. Awesome, all right, we're yeah. almost to the end. I asked the one thing question, the one thing you wanna remind us about, or something you just wanna make sure this audience hears mm -hmm. before you leave today. I, I want people to step up and embrace the exposure of, mm -hmm. of do it, raising your hand in the meeting more, of, of taking on the new responsibility. And to do that, we have to be intentional about the relationships with the belay so we can embrace exposure uh, and, and take those. Be willing those, to, yeah. to risk a little. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. So step up and just move forward yeah. and see what happens. Yeah, build, build, build the relationships first, get the clarity of this current climb uh, so that when that time comes, you are comfortable and you feel confident enough to raise your hand. Awesome. Manly Feinberg, author of Reaching Your Next Summit. Thanks for being on the yeah, show. Thanks. Okay. Yeah, thanks. I appreciate you. It's time to hear from you and time to ask Shep. You can find me just about anywhere on social media, and don't forget to use the hashtag AskShep. So let's begin. Courtney Wessels is a marketing and social media director at a real estate company, and she asks, we've tried a couple of different methods to survey our clients' experience with us, but hardly getting any responses. How can we get the feedback that we need without annoying our clients? Well, there are several very important strategies to successfully garner feedback from your customers. First, when you ask for the feedback. If you sold somebody a house and waited a month, it's too late. It's simply a case of out of sight and out of mind. The best time for most businesses is usually within 24 hours. For example, if you own a restaurant, a survey sent to a guest the very next day is great timing. Real estate is different than a restaurant or a store or a hotel, so you have to judge when the interaction with your client has come to an end. Second is to warn the client that the survey is coming. Say something like, hey, thanks again for the opportunity to work with you. In the next day or so, you'll be receiving a short survey. It would be much appreciated if you take the time to fill it out. And third, make it short. I just mentioned to warn your client that the survey would be short, and you need to emphasize that. And then keep the survey to just a few questions. You don't want the last impression your clients have of you to be a long and time-consuming survey. Now, let's hear from Kelly Brandenburg, who works for a major league baseball team, and she asks, we gave away an item at one of our games that just simply didn't work the way we promised and left a lot of people upset. How can we regain trust with our fans following a crisis like this? Well, it sounds like the generosity of a free gift backfired. So I have this five-step process. It can be used for complaints or something much bigger. The idea is that you want to restore your customer's confidence, and in this case, your fan's confidence. In this situation, you must first acknowledge that you made the mistake. 
Second, you must apologize for that. Now, these two set up the opportunity to fix what needs to be fixed. You might say something like, the other night, our free giveaway did not reflect the quality and experience that we want our fans to have. For that, we apologize. That's step one and step two. Next, you discuss what you're going to do to fix the problem. Maybe it's an offer to get another giveaway at the next game. Then, throughout the entire process, you own the problem, never blaming others. Finally, you act with urgency. You quickly make your acknowledgement and apologize. So the steps are acknowledge the problem, apologize for it, fix it, own it, and act with urgency. You can use this process from small complaints to crisis level situations that can create a big problem for a company or a brand. And finally, Ted West has owned and operated a small breakfast and brunch restaurant for nearly 50 years. And he asks, customers seem to have higher expectations than ever. Why are they comparing experiences across industries and how can I overcome that challenge in my business? Well, if you've been following my work, you've probably heard me write about this or say this before. You may compete against direct competition, but you're compared to the best service your customers have ever received. Customers are smarter than ever when it comes to customer service. Rockstar companies have taught the customers what it's like to receive great service. So customers like it and then they want it from everyone they do business with. So. Step up to the challenge. Become one of the rock star companies, or in your case, rock star restaurants that raise the bar for everyone. So are you ready to be amazing? Connect with me on any one of our social channels and don't forget to use the hashtag AskShep to ask your question or share your amazing story. Time now for the amazing quote brought to you by First Rule, and it comes from Simon Sinek, author of the book, Start With Why. People don't buy what you do, they buy why you do it. Now this quote makes me think about the different reasons behind why a customer chooses to do business with a company. There are plenty of them to consider, but here are 10 reasons why customers could pick you over someone else. Number one, price. Some people choose price as a primary reason. Those companies that get customers because of a low price will lose customers when someone else has a lower price. The loyalty is to the price, not the company. Number two, convenience. Who doesn't want an easy and frictionless experience? People are often willing to pay a higher price if the experience is convenient. Number three, the service. Customers love the way you treat them. Employees are friendly, knowledgeable, and quick to respond. You're there to take care of them, and in turn, they take care of you by doing business with you. Number four, the culture. This is the kind of organization customers want to be affiliated with. Their values are congruent with yours. Number five, a cause. Customers believe in what you believe in. At some level, this ties into culture and values, but this is more about giving back and community involvement. It can be a charity or any other cause that's important to you and the customer. Number six, trust. Customers trust you. You do what you say every time. If they don't trust the organization, they probably wouldn't be doing business with you anyway. Number seven, reputation. They've heard good things. Maybe it's comments from friends or colleagues at work, or maybe there are plenty of reviews that can confirm that this is a good company. Reputation is a big part of the decision. Number eight, consistency. This ties in with trust and reputation. If there is something that erodes trust quicker than anything, it's a lack of consistency. You want customers to use the word always to describe their experience with you. They're always friendly. They're always knowledgeable. They're always helpful. Well, you get the idea. Number nine, the way. This is the way that you do business. It's about process, policies, your hours, location, and more. It's really about your operation. These are very tangible reasons. They may get a customer in the door, but many of the other reasons are why customers choose to come back. And finally, number 10, the why. Let's end where we started with Simon Sinek's quote. 
All of these reasons and more may contribute to the decision of why a customer chooses one company over another. When you figure out a customer's why and can scale it to meet the reasons and needs of a larger group, you connect on another level that brings customers back again and again. Well, that wraps up this edition of Be Amazing or Go Home. Remember, you can find me everywhere on social media and be sure to use the hashtag AskShep to ask your question or share your amazing story. Thanks for tuning in. This is Shep Hyken reminding you to always be amazing.